We wanted to thank you all so much for being here. We are live streaming this recording with Maureen St. Germain. So I will be opening up the conversation in a little bit for people to ask their own questions. And I just want to encourage you to think about um, the fact that this is being recorded. It will be broadcast out and continue to be accessible. So keep that in mind in terms of, you know, this is a public conversation. Um, and also when you ask your questions, I just ask you to um, think about being succinct so we can keep the conversation moving. Um, so with that being said, welcome to the Meditation Conversation, the podcast to support your spiritual revolution. I'm your host, Kara Goodwin, and I'm so excited to have you here today and to have the amazing Maureen St. Germain. Uh, Maureen has spent over 25 years with in the area of mystical and sacred traditions. She's known as the practical mystic and is a prolific teacher and facilitator of spiritual knowledge for contemporary life. A lifelong interest in the Akashic Records resulted in her being granted access to this dimension that's been off limits to most of humanity for millions of years. Founder of the Akashic Records International, Maureen is an extremely accurate Akashic Records guide and instructor. She's the founder of the St. Germain Mystery School, the Ascension Institute, and Founders Circle. An internationally recognized teacher and intuitive, she also is the creator of the app Illuminate, which is rich with guided meditations, tunings, chants, and activations. And living your best 5D life is Maureen St. Germain's eighth book. And this is a beautiful, beautiful book that I highly recommend if you haven't dived into this yet, um, please do yourself a favor and get on that. I have found it so enriching and I've loved it. So with all of that being said, welcome Maureen. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners who are tuning in live. It's awesome. It's great to have people live. It's amazing. Yes. Thank yes. Thank you so much for doing this. And I know we had a great time last time. We had some amazing questions, so I'm super excited as well. Um, I would love to start by talking about this, this wonderful book, Living Your Best 5D Life. I know that this is the third in the series of books on 5D. So can you talk about your goal with this series and how the latest the latest book fits in. Um, I want to start out by reading just part of the dedication to help people understand what my uh, impetus was. I always knew that there would be three books on 5D. And so here we are. This book is a heartfelt tribute to the cherished clients, friends, and partners who unwavering, whose unwavering support has fueled both myself and this endeavor. Through the extraordinary journey into the realm of 5D, We've been enveloped in boundless kindness, creativity, and inspiration. So my impetus for writing the book was to fulfill my guidance that said I needed to write three books. And when I um, uh, agreed to you know, put this book forward, everything just fell into place. Even the time to write it fell into place. It was amazing. Um, as you can imagine, uh, each of us have busy, busy lives, and I know you are no exception. So carving out, you know, windows of time and opportunities, um, this was the easiest one to write because e even as your connection to source has increased, so has mine. So it gets easier and easier to really just express at that level. Mm. I'm very grateful. And, you know, it takes the audience to... Uh, make that happen. You know, the eager minds, eager souls. Right. Yes. Well, I love that you bring up the time aspect that the time just came out of nowhere because one of the places in this book where I was like, I couldn't turn my eyes away was when you talked about the, the time, the time piece and, and I, the word that's coming up is manipulate, and I don't want to say it like that, but working with time, like stretching time and condensing time. And you have some some amazing examples of this and and guidance on how we can work with time, because we tend to think of time as like it's just happening and it's just happening to us. 
but you really have this different approach. And I must say that through reading your book and through getting this deeper understanding and like just some, some connections being made in my own consciousness, I have been using this. I've been like, okay, I need more time today. Let's stretch time and kind of working within myself to stretch time. And what's funny is I will get reflections in the outer world. Not only will I get things done that I, you know, didn't think I'd have time to get done, but then I get people in my world going, how is today 58 hours? <laughs> and they have no idea that I've been doing anything. And I'm like, you know, just inside like, oh my gosh, it's, it's being reflected in others. So um, you know, can you share with us about time? Yes. And I, I think this was one of my dharmas because I have always had this very, um, I guess the word is unnormal, not normal relationship with time. And in the early years, I didn't recognize it or understand it or know it, but I wasn't inclined to wear a watch when I would, there was a time when I was working in my corporate job and then flying every weekend to a new city for a series of seminars and then back to my corporate job. And I never used an alarm clock and I didn't think about it um, other than, oh, that's pretty cool. I don't have to use an alarm clock and not recognizing that time didn't rule me. And, and what we want to understand is that time is a construct. It is like a stencil that you use to put a cool thing on your bike or a um, stencil that you put on a cake and you make a cute design. <laughs> Excuse me. Why is this important? Because then you begin to see that time is something that you can manipulate. It doesn't control you. And that's the first thing. And then the second thing happened um, in 2008, the Lords of Time came through me. And I was not expecting that. I didn't even know there were such a group of beings called the Lords of Time. And I sat down in China to uh, transmit uh, an, you know, a channeled message. And out of nowhere came these beings. And they were so um, big and so powerful that I'm going to imitate the way they came through. We are the Lords of Time. And I thought, whoa, I wonder what that is. I had never experienced anything like that. So my first experience with the Lords of Time uh, changed everything. Because then, in addition to my understanding of, you know, time doesn't control me, I control time. And I had this, like I said, this very non-traditional interaction with time. I began to understand why I was always like that. Um, and I'm going to tell one time story that when I was still working corporate, I was, uh, you know, had my suitcase packed, everything ready to go. I'm flying tomorrow morning and I'm knee deep into my, um, binder with all my resource material. And I'm, I'm in this blissed out place, you know, I'm just loving being able to study this a little further and make sure that I understand and can teach what I want to teach. And I looked at the clock and it was like two o'clock in the morning. I don't, oh my gosh, I, my flight's at six. I've only got a couple hours to sleep. So I put my book away and, you know, put everything by the door. Everything's ready to go. And I climb in bed and I'd say to Archangel Michael, I'd like to wake up on time and plenty of time to catch my flight. So the flight's at 6 a.m. And at 6 a.m. I sat bolt upright in bed and went, oh my gosh, it's six o'clock. I wonder what's going on. Now, that's the first test. It's very easy to say, oh, my gosh, I missed my flight and validate what you don't want. But instead, my response, and, it, and it, believe me, I had to force myself to say this to myself. What's going on? Archangel Michael didn't let me down. I wonder what's going on. So fortunately for me, I was in the, at the airport within 30 minutes because I lived close to the airport and I was ready. I walk into the counter and show the clerk my materials. And she looks at me and she said, oh, your flight was canceled. Let me see if I can get you on another flight. And what she did 
it, back in those days, I was always hitting two cities to get to my destination because it was a hundred dollars cheaper. And so she put me on a direct flight. I got into my destination an hour ahead of my original arrival time. Everything was as smooth as silk. And I realized as I'm sitting on the plane, I just got an extra three hours worth of sleep. If I had used an alarm clock, you know, I would have been up at three. You know, I would have had one hour of sleep. And that is exactly why we want to use time instead of having time dictate to us. Wow. That is a powerful story. Oh my goodness. And I love, I want to read what um, George wrote here because I have not heard this before, but I love this. He says, time is art, not money. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> which, brilliant. Which like encompasses it. your story beautifully. Yeah, so that's brilliant. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So I do want to open it up for questions, guys. So if you are joining us on the Zoom, you're welcome to, there's a react button down at the bottom. You can click that and raise your hand and then you can come on, on screen if you want to and ask, or you can type in the chat if you want to ask your question that way. Um, I have lots of other questions too, while we let people prepare their questions, um, so let's just step back with when we're talking about 5D and 3D. And I think that a lot of people who are here um, joining us understand what, what, what 5D is and how it's different from 3D. But I think that it's good to just lay this foundation. Like what, what do you mean in terms of what 5D is and how is that different than what we're experiencing now? Okay. So the first thing is uh, an outward appearance is physically 3d and 5d don't look much different because it's a vibrational data set it is not a location so we tend to think of 3d and 5d as location even though we know that it's just the vibe that we're in so how does that play out that means you can slide into 5d and not even realize it and then slide back into 3d usually when you have been in 5d and then you slide back you think to yourself, oh my gosh, what just happened? You know, I'm I'm reacting. And, you know, an hour ago, I was really nice and really in a mellow place. So 3D has polarity of good and evil, right and wrong. And in 5D, those pejoratives don't exist. That means they're not available as a choice for human expression. So... That's the first part. Then the second part is we're we're plugged in into the reality in a deeper way. We're all plugged into the reality now, but most of the time we've kind of deadened those uh, data sets. And then as we slide into 5D, we actually start to open that up. And that means I'm in tune with you, Kara. I'm in tune with... Um, the audience, I'm in tune with the people that I, I'm interacting with or working with. And that vibe allows me to know things so that when I open my mouth, I say something that's extremely appropriate related to all that data instead of just Maureen's own little drama, whatever that might be. And I'll give you an example. This morning, I've been at an outside conference. I've not been in my home. And I have an adventure that's planned for today. And I went to bed last night completely spacing out the fact that you and I were going to be together. And then this morning, uh, I woke up and I'm looking at the clock. And all of a sudden, I could feel all this energy. Kara Goodwin, Kara Goodwin. <laughs> and I look at my clock I, again. I look at our appointment time. And I think, oh, my gosh, I got to get ready right now. And I don't know if that would have happened if if I weren't waking up in 5D because I might have just said, oh, I've got this great adventure and completely forget about it. Even though I had told everybody I have one appointment outside uh, in between the conference and this little adventure I'm doing. So I love I'm that. grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful. So 5D is what everyone else calls heaven. and But it's heaven on earth. And this is the first time consciousness is expressing this way where we're going to take our 3D bodies and our 3D environment 
and transform it into a place where our only choices are helpful and and loving. And so the harmful and hurtful choices don't exist. So you're going to the regular grocery store and you're going to buy something. No matter what you buy, it's always good for you. That's what it's like. There's no bad choices like the chips and the soda and the stuff we like when we're stressed out. <laughs> I love that. Well, I'm very grateful that you woke up in 5D and <laughs> that we get to have you here today. <laughs> So Yari is asking, is 5D the same as Ether Akash dimension? No, it is not. Um, first of all, uh, Ether is a name that we use to refer to an energetic data set that's related to our vibe and our consciousness. So your etheric body, for example, is the part of you that is finely tuned and plugged in to a higher consciousness. Uh, Akashic records um, and the Akash are in uh, the 11th dimension. Now, there is a whole body of knowledge that people sometimes use the term Akash to represent anything that is not material. And the reason for that is because the word Akash stands for sky in in um the uh, language that we're using to translate um, Akash. So the term has kind of evolved and the Akash could be anything that's not material. 5D is not equated in that way because 5D is your vibration. It's not something outside of us. It is our vibration that's tuning to a higher consciousness. So it's a little bit like the jump from AM radio to FM radio. It's still turning in the dial. Mm. Okay. That's, that's, I love that. So when we think about 5d, because a lot of your material is like moving from 3d to 5d and it's, you know, things that an individual can do practices that, that we can adopt to help to accelerate that. Um, and of course, we're all part of the collective as well here, the collective humanity experience here on earth. How do you see those two things working together? Like, will, do you see the collective also moving into 5D or do you, and how, how does that relate to the individual? Um, I see everyone becoming fifth dimensional and I joke around that 5D is the uh, place that everybody's going to, whether they want to or not. And it's kind of like, we're all going to get in that car and go on a family vacation. And we're some of us are waiting on others. The um, visual that I was given by my guides is that there's three Earths, the crash and burn Earth, and that's souls who have chosen an evil path and refuse to recognize that they can unhook from it and that they have free will to um, interact with the reality in a new way. Then the second one is the do over earth. And I'll explain that in a minute. And the third one is pretty self-explanatory because it's called the ascending earth and the do over earth and the ascending earth are going to be allowed to interact for a minimum of three generations. That means you and I are going to be interacting with people that are in what I call the do over earth. Now, what does do over mean? It means those people who are good people who have a love and respect for themselves and humanity. They believe in some version of God and that kind of thing, but they're, they're on a narrow scope. They do not accept that they are cosmic beings. They do not believe anything beyond what they're, version of the truth is. So they're not expanding. They're not allowing this awakening to stir them to change their beliefs or to change their bias. Now, I, I want to I want to go into a, a segue here and say, every one of us requires boundaries to understand the reality around us. Every one of us frames what we're experiencing. And in the first book on 5D, Waking Up in 5D, what I did was start to explain to people that the experiences they were having were actually 5D experiences. So 
that was a big aha for a lot of people. And then that led the way to, you know, adding the tools and teachings that would help us anchor our energy into 5D. So we get the opportunity to interact with everyone as they make their choices. And anybody who's listening to this is probably on the trajectory of the ascending earth, but you're still going to interact with people who aren't at that level. Mm. That makes sense. Um, I have a follow-up question for that. And I want to remind, I want to re-invite everybody. If you would like to ask any questions, please do raise your hand. You just click that react button at the bottom and then there's a raise hand or you can type it like Yari did there. So, um, so do you have any going back to time, I guess, um, do you have any sense of timing in terms of as those evolutions are happening of the ascending earth and the do over earth and so forth? And I wonder if you see it accelerating at all or, or over the years. Well, first of all, to give a frame the the tide is coming in and all the ships are going to rise. So we can look at it that way. It's inevitable. It's a little bit like thinking about our children. You know, when they're teenagers, sometimes they do stupid stuff, but then they do something mature and then they follow with something stupid. And that's us. We also are doing spiritually advanced things. And then we slide back into our 3D behavior and then we slide back. And I'm going to go back to the timing question, but in just a minute, but I want to make a metaphor and that is, each of us can ask our guidance, our inner wisdom, uh, am I doing anything to lock myself into 3D? And I won't tell the whole story, but you can get the picture when my guide said yes to me. And uh, this was, you know, probably 10 years ago. And they said, um, it's when you drive on the San Diego freeway, which is hilarious when you think about it, because any big city with a freeway, th there's going to be craziness. And for whatever reason, the energy of people being in their car, it's like, I'm in my car and get out of my way. And you don't even realize you're carrying that vibe until someone cuts in front of you. And then you think, hey, what are they doing? And in my case, I I was proactive and I started making up funny stories about why people were cutting me off to the point that I no longer am, I no longer have a charge when someone does that, I make room for them. If they start to cut over, I, I make room for them. And an occasion when I'm driving and I feel like I'm not doing that, I, I say, okay, Maureen, pull it together, you know. So so we all have those, I'll call it temptations, to respond in a 3D way. And the proactive thing is to train ourselves to notice our response and then do a counter response that moves us in another direction. You know, it's like it's like what they say when you're dieting. If you always have this pattern of eating chips and soda after dinner while you're watching TV, you find something new to, de to do after dinner where you're not inclined to sit and veg and eat. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we're looking at our behaviors and saying, okay, what could I do that's different? You know, one of the things, this is really crazy, one of the things that my guides are saying, if if you're the kind of person that has that kind of reaction on the freeway, you might actually choose to leave earlier so that whatever people do, it's not a problem because you've got plenty of time. Uh -huh. You know, this this used to happen to me at the airport where people would, you know, I got to catch a plane, you know, and when security was really long and crazy. And I thought to myself, because I usually got there plenty of time. I need to let these people in because if I were in that in their shoes, I would need that. So I, I, you know, please take my spot or move in front of me. Um, so part of it is capturing your own self behavior and your awareness, and then playing with it and and contemplating what could I do that would be different from that, and then choosing that behavior as a reframe every time. Mm. Well, thank you for that. I, I'm afraid that you are speaking directly to me when you talk about being frustrated while you drive. That is definitely one of my um, 
my low points of the day in terms of my evolution when I'm behind the wheel and I don't agree with people's decisions. (laughs) (laughs) So now let's go back to the original question you had about time. And let me say that 20 years ago, I said that I thought uh, it was going to take 40 years. So we're halfway in and we're looking at another 20 years. And, you know, if, if you have ever raised a child, you know that there's lots of times that you look at the effort you put forth or the behavior that you're observing and have some kind of doubt or regret or what do I do now kind of thing. Um, so it's not, it's going to be with us in, in an instant. And then the other part of it is there's a wonderful guided meditation called the golden time. And we can bring it in faster than the 20 years. And the way we would do that is the golden time meditation takes you through a process where you are amplifying all the goodness and you're bringing your family and friends in with you and creating a vibe that makes it easy for them to slide up into the 5D expression. And it's a little bit like having a child wear a uniform to school, somehow the respect for the uniform translates into better behavior in the classroom. So we're just creating a vibe. We're not interfering with their free will, but we're sending this loving, supportive vibe that encourages that behavior. It's it's like you're driving on the freeway and You think I can get off at the next exit or I can wait and go two more exits and get off there. And you see that the the traffic is starting to pile up and you're coming up on the first exit. You know what? Let me take this one. It's a little bit like that. The vibe is just there to make it easy to make a decision that in 3D we would call the right decision. In 5D we would call the optimal decision, the opportunity to choose that which would make us happy, that which would support our evolution. Mm, that's amazing. And is that on the insights or the, sorry, the illuminate app, that meditation? Yes. It's called the golden time and it is on the app and there, the app is a free app and uh, there is a paid version that has, you know, over 30 guided meditations and they're all very purposeful. I'm a very purpose driven kind of person. And a lot of these uh, meditations were the result of my own angst and need and um, at the same time, I was sold, make it available for others. Mm. So I'm curious, as we're talking about the, you know, the optimal decisions and working through, um, you know, kind of creating higher choices. I love the things that you're talking about in terms of like, if you can leave a little bit earlier so that you're not as, you know, you can be in a different mind frame when you're driving, for example. Can we talk a little bit about like, authentic emotions and our our conscious evolution in in terms of really like the role of feeling our feelings while also undergoing a type of training into a higher version of ourselves does that make sense yes it does and w- what's interesting is um a lot of people are very action oriented And we want to take an action. So if our partner or our family member has a big emotion, we want to fix it. We want to respond to that emotion in a proactive way. But in fact, the need is validation. Not solution, but validation. That's huge. What an aha. You know, if if the car is broken uh, and, and it needs something fixed, you take it to the shop. And they fix it. But if your family member is expressing emotion, their need is to validate their emotion. Now, what happens in 5D is that we're so plugged into source and we're so plugged into our authentic self, we don't require another person to validate us because we feel the validation in our being. But in 3D, we don't have that. And so emotion grows and and it's very curious because people don't realize that what they are seeking is just someone to say, I hear you. 
I hear you. I feel your pain um, and not to solve it because solving it means you skipped over my, my, you skipped over my pain. You skipped over, you've ignored the pain. You just want to go to the solution. You don't really care about me. And it's, it's so interesting to see this and it's a big aha for a lot of people. So emotion is a way to get closer to source because the leap between 3D and 5D is through emotion. And a lot of people don't realize that. So when you're in a heavy emotional state, whether it's high joy or high sadness, the uh, veils get thinner and your connection to source gets bigger. And if you're going to stay in that loop of dissatisfaction and unhappiness, you will perpetuate the problem. If you're in joy and you are in high vibe, you slide right into 5D without even realizing it. So there's this quality of 4D that makes you move more, makes you move faster than you would in 3D. So that's another way you can kind of notice what's going on. Ah, you know, yesterday when I was all upset and all worked up, I was actually getting ready to slide into 5D, but instead I used my emotion to... Uh, perpetuate my wound and to validate me because nobody else will, you know. So th the key here is to understand that emotion is the tool, again, another tool that allows us to experience the reality with greater intensity. And it is up to us to recognize that we only need to do that once. We don't need to do it multiple times. We have tended to use emotion to fuel our wound and to re-injure ourselves emotionally by retelling our sad story. And this is why I told people in the first book I wrote, which is called Be a Genie, stop telling your story to everyone that comes along and instead count and only tell it three times. And when you do that, you've created permission to validate yourself with others, but you've also put a hard stop on re-injuring yourself. Because after you do it the third time, if you keep doing it, you're re-injuring yourself. And then you've created another wound that you got to undo. Mm, I love that. That's amazing. And it, it feels like when you were talking about that, it's like, it's like you're cementing it in as well. Like the more adept you get at telling your story, <laughs> the more like solid it gets, you know? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it's interesting you 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 um slid in 40 there. So do you want to kind of we cuz it it does feel like if you're if you're not familiar with the dimensions it can feel like wait we're talking about 3D we're talking about 5D is there 4D like how does that fit in? Well, uh, you know, it's funny I've taken to singing it and I'm not the world's best singer <laughs> so we'll start out with that disclaimer. But it helps people to hear it. So to you know, turn your ears up and, and really listen for a second, and you'll begin to understand. I'm going to sing a major chord, um, which is similar to the um, a, a major scale, which is like in The Sound of Music, the, sound, the song Do a Deer, a Female Deer, that one. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. You can hear each of those pitches. One, three, five, three, one. That's the chord. And now I'm going to sing those notes and you're going to, I'm going to use numbers. So you really track one, three, four, 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 four wants to go down, four wants to go up. And if it goes up, it wants to go to the octave. So what happens is four is the place of transition. Um, my standard line is it's like Grand Central Station. No one goes there to spend the night. You go there to get somewhere else. You go to the train station to get somewhere else. You go to the airport to go somewhere else. So those locations are like the vibe of 4D. And remember, we're talking vibrational data set. The, the physical world you live in is still showing up. Mm. So is, sorry, let me come back on here. So is there a, um, like an, an astral realm connection to oh, it? Oh yeah. The, the fourth dimension is also the, the place of the astral realm and the astral realm has gotten a bad rap because it is a place where there's a lot of 
I'll use the word demons and negative energies. So yes, um, the astral realm is found in 4D. It's not the only thing that's found in 4D. So it's a subset within the vibrational data set of 4D. And when people say they want to astral travel, because the astral has become known as this place in 4D that's not so nice, it's actually uh, ideal to say I'm sliding into 5D and I'm going to meditate and and take myself to 5D or higher. And when you're meditating and you take yourself to 5D, you can you heard how easy it would be to go higher. Mm. That's awesome. So I know we have a lot of people who are here live with us who are um, from all over the world. So I don't want to spend too much time focusing on the U.S., but this is election day that we happen to be um, here in. And I, you know, actually, I have been surprised in my world. Of course, we're all approaching our lives from our own perspectives and what's going on around us, but it's been a lot gentler than I expected. Um but it is just, it's its sort of a time out of time, I feel, you know, um, because this is such a collective time that, you know, today there's a lot, It's it, we're kind of all it, uh, focused on this one topic and what's going to happen and we're thinking about the future and, and our past and there's so much going into it. What do you want to offer for today for people who are wanting to make that transition to 5D when there's something so strong in the collective and it's not necessarily pleasant always, um, but it's right here in our faces. How, what's the best way, or let me say, like, how do you approach these kinds of, of opportunities in the collective? Well, I would highly recommend that you download the app and play the meditation, Divine Government Meditation. This is a non-polarity, non-biased meditation where you're calling in the higher self for each and every political leader, every boss, every um, person that supervises you in any way. And it's a really love, lovely meditation. And then near the end, there is a call for the removal of any Luciferian energy. And the Luciferian energy is a quality that would take us away from our ascension or our divine path of evolution. So it's not necessarily like we're talking about the devil per se, but it's the idea that um, we can demand that the field be cleared. You know, it's, it's a little bit like you're gonna go to someone's house and they're in a gated community. And you arrive and then nobody told you there was a gate. So you call the person and say, look, I'm at the door. I'm at the gate. I can't even get into your complex. So they tell the doorman or the machine to open the gate. So what this does is opens the gate to the highest expression that we could possibly create on this reality. And the more of us that do this meditation, the more likely it will happen sooner rather than later. And this is on the free app. So there's no reason to not have it and not do it. And if you have study groups or prayer groups that are praying for a, a, a certain outcome, unhook from the outcome you're seeking and do the divine government meditation so that you can stay out of polarity and in a place of divine intervention, if that's what you believe in. Mm. This makes me think of, I, I think it's in the Merkaba book, um, but there, and now I'm trying to remember, there was like a, a United Nations experience mm. that you had. Would you mind sharing that? That was so powerful. It seems relevant to now. Um, I was told to go to the United Nations. I was told to make it very low profile. It was at a time when we um, the people in, in New York City, where I was living at the time, we were meeting regularly, but we also felt that there was an energy that was um, trying to run interference. That's the best way I can put it. So I was told to go to the meditation room by my guides, and I was given very explicit instructions on what to do. Now, if, if you're a meditator and you want to meditate on this, you can 
Google or search uh, the meditation room in the United Nations. And the man who built that uh, was a brilliant um, mystic, I think. And he was determined to have a meditation room in that place. Not very common for something like that. And he was able to put his hands on the largest single piece of magnetite, which is a stone that holds a very high vibration. And at the same time connects to the earth because it's magnetite. It means it has the quality of, of um, the magnetics. So it had high iron. And I was told to see this like a chest of drawers. And I was opening and closing drawers um, based upon what I was being shown. And then one of my students could see at higher realms what was happening. And she could see that we were literally plugging into a new timeline that would be less, uh, be more, let me put it another way, that a new timeline that would be even more helpful for humanity to shift and become our highest self. Mm. Yeah, it was it was amazing. Uh, and we had the place to ourselves. No one came in. And I've been in the meditation room at other times with other people and, you know, people come and go. And so it was, you were, you were accessing the chest of drawers, like in the ether. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So magnetite is like a solid piece of, if you can imagine a solid piece of marble and think of your kitchen countertop as a standalone island, and then think of a piece of, of one kind of rock magnetite that was solid and about the same size, you know, chest high, a little bit above your waistline height, and then solid all the way down to the floor. And it would be the size of, I'm going to say it's like 12 foot by four foot, something like that, or 12 foot by three foot. And then the full height of, I don't know, four foot. So it was, it was like, a, like your kitchen counter really. Hmm. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. So I also, you know, you are well versed in the Akash and the Akashic records, and you were given access to this dimension. And I have read your book on the Akashic records as well. Um, there we go. I was just thinking, I wish I would have brought that one down here. Um, so, and it's, it's, um, I don't want to say it's simple, but you make it so easy to follow. You know, there's an invocation. Yes. Thank you. Straightforward. Um, but I know you have an, an institute of, of people who can give people Akashic readings and, um, but I'd love to t explore the Akashic records a little bit with you and maybe let's start first in case that's a new term for, for people. Can you talk about what the Akashic records are? Yes. So the Akashic records are a body of knowledge that represents all of the experiences that have occurred and the likely scenarios that will occur that have not yet occurred. So, you know, there's these video games and books where they say, if you choose this, go to this chapter. If you choose this, go to this chapter. So it's kind of like an open-ended kind of ending. And what I have observed is opening the Akashic Records is a tool to access a broader view of what's really going on in our reality and in others. And I'll give you an example that occurred on a show like this, where a man called in and said, you know, he'd been in a tough spot with his daughter. She was an adult. He had raised her um, with his own beliefs, which was he was a meditator and he felt that he'd been a good father and he couldn't figure out why she was so, uh, I'll use the word inappropriate with him. And the record keepers answered him and said that you were arch rivals in another lifetime. And you went on and pursued your spiritual growth and she did not. And in this lifetime, you agreed to sponsor her. 
So the first thing the record keepers wanted to make clear is that it was not karmic. He had done this as an offer, as a way to help humanity and help his, his former uh, enemy. And then they said, this is going to take some time. And she still sees you as her enemy, even though she doesn't know why. She has this vibe that makes her feel that way towards you. So your job is to love her anyway. And to look at the next two to five years as incubation. And you loving her anyway means that you would do all the things you would do if you were on good terms. So if you would be likely to send a birthday card, send a birthday card. If you were likely to send texts or emails, do that. And keep it low key, no pressure, no judgment. Just I'm here. I love you. I hope you're doing okay. And in time, it she will shift. Again, we have free will. The daughter might not shift, but it's highly likely that she will because she's receiving all this love. So she's being surrounded with love. And as a parent, when you have this, this you know, crossing of hairs with an offspring, it's very frustrating and painful emotionally to think that your all your effort is for naught that that you've raised a child that could be hurtful and when you recognize that they'll get through it and they'll come out the other side it's like a breath of fresh air and now you know it's not forever you have the ability i can wait i can wait just like when you get tired of changing diapers and you can't wait for the child to learn how to potty train. It's a little bit like that. You you can wait because you know it's coming. You know it's coming. And that's the thing you want to hold for yourself. It's coming. The, the, the evolution and the solution of all of this is coming. And we can bring it sooner by doing certain things. But it's inevitable. Mm. That's beautiful. So when you receive the guidance from the Akashic Records, is it similar to your when you're receiving guidance from your guides or your higher self? It is different. And there, there's different qualities. So for example, um, when you check in with your own higher self, you're going to get a direct response. You're going to get direct information. You're going to get straightforward yes, no's, um, do this, don't do that. In the records, the information is more like when you're talking to your grandma who knows a whole bunch of stuff and he or grandpa and he or she uh, advises you, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that path if I were you. Now they don't actually say it that way, but they would say the path you're choosing is not going to take you where you want to go. They don't say you're bad or wrong. Do you see the difference? Whereas your higher self would say, just don't go there. You know, doesn't even give you a, a feeling of being supported. So I call it the hammock effect. So when you're in the records, you feel embraced, you feel cherished, you feel loved. That alone makes you more receptive to whatever else they're going to say to you. And they're going to give you a much bigger picture. So here the man was, you know, looking at the narrow picture. I'm nice to her. I'm sweet to her. And all I get is crap. And the records keepers are saying, yeah, but this is the bigger picture. And now you understand you didn't cause it. You didn't create it. You're here to help. You're mm -hmm. part of the EMT team. You know, you're just here to help. Yeah. You know, think about being an EMT. And, and many people are like the cosmic EMTs. They're here to help. They're not here to learn a lesson. They're not here to change the world. They're here to help. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, oh, George is asking, what what is an EMT? Um, th those are the guys that, that um, work in an ambulance. So they're called emergency medical, medical technicians. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And Ola is saying she would like to find out her life purpose. I don't know if you have any insight on that or if you have access to the Akash at the moment. Um, I would recommend that you reach out and uh, reach to our um, team and, and set something up, even if it's just a quick 15 minutes. 
there is a couple of ways you can find that out. And one of them would be to have an Akashic Records reading and the record keepers would come in. I, I'm reluctant to answer that kind of a question on this broadcast because I was not planning on opening the records for individuals. If I had known that, you know, we're going to give individual um, personal questions, I might have done something different. But this book does teach you how to do it for yourself. And the other thing you can do, uh, oh, is it Olga or Krista? It uh, was Ula. Ula is is just to, in your meditations to say, I'd like to know what my purpose is. I need to know my purpose. And, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, when I was asking that question, um, I didn't get a direct answer. What I got was people coming up to me and saying, you know, when you come in the room, the room lights up. You change the vibe. Your presence makes a difference. And that's when I began to understand that my purpose was to support people being the best they can be. Mm -hmm. So, Ula, make sure you keep asking the universe to show you what your purpose is. And then you're probably doing your purpose now, but you haven't framed it. And so if you haven't framed it in a way that you can recognize, oh yeah, that's me. You know, it's like there are people whose purpose is to be a connector and their job is to introduce people to other people. They connect people. And <laughs> when they get told this, they say, oh, I've been doing that all my life. So you're very likely leaning into your purpose. Once you frame it and have a cognitive awareness of it, it will improve your capacity to express that. Mm. That makes so much sense. That's awesome. Crystal is asking, do you need to go into an Akashic Record reading with a specific question or questions in mind, or just can you just check in? Um, the way uh, my guides have taught me to teach and to the students that uh, the qualified guides that have been trained by me is we tap into your field and we give you what's called opening remarks. So the minute you choose to have an Akashic Records reading, your consciousness starts to merge into the records and starts doing like a data search. And so then when you actually have your appointment, the um, opening remarks is, is like pivotal. And a lot of times clients will say, oh my gosh, you answered all my questions before I even, uh, before I even got to ask them. Uh, the second thing is we do provide people with a list of questions. And there's a list of questions in the um, book on kinds of questions you can ask. Now, if you want to do this for yourself, you still may need ideas on what to ask. So most people who open the Akashic Records just start in with the questions. But, but my guides were very clear that opening remarks was significant and important and appropriate. So that's what we do. Mm. And you have the Akashic Records Institute. And the, if I understand correctly, this is where you're training people how to use, how to access. But then I think it's also a resource for people. If you want to have a reading, you can go and find readers. Is that right? Um, yes. First of all, the, um, the uh, Founder Circle is a training of both marketing and business uh, tools. So we help you get set up. We help you create a business of reading records for clients. And it's very appropriate for anybody who wants to go into a training where we've addressed all of the areas. You know, I've trained thousands of people. And what I want is to be able to help people not just do it as a hobby, but to take it to the level where the professionalism and the capacity to support your clients is uh, high enough that your clients tell other people and you're, you create a business for yourself. And there are many people who know that they need to help people. There are many people who are I'll use the word plugged in, they get good information without even trying. And so whether you have that skill or not, this training will take you to another level of, co of uh, capacity that will serve those around you as, as 
a way to help people be the best they can be. It, you know, it's quite interesting. There are a lot of people who say, you know, I don't get anything. I don't, I close my eyes. I don't even see colors. And yet when we teach them how to open the records and we teach the protocol and I, I teach a lot of tools on top of the protocol to not, I don't just teach them the, you know, the process to do it. I teach them how to recognize certain things and patterns and all of it. And people who have been, I'll say deaf to the inner wisdom suddenly are amazing and bringing forth amazing information. And they'll say to us, you know, I, I'm so amazed. It just flows. Mm. Well, that answers Sandra's question, which I think she was speaking for many of us when she says, I've done some classes in Akashic Records, but I'm always not sure if what I hear is from the records or just my mind. And how do you work it out at the beginning? Yes. And so that's one of the things that we cover in our coursework. And I, I have many tools that help you identify that you are in the records. And some of them I've described already. I called it the hammock effect. Other ways is that there we I teach people to have an awareness of what the difference is between their higher self and the record keepers. And that distinction starts to help people recognize, oh, that's not my thought. That's coming from the record keepers. So there's, you know, there's certain ways you are able to identify. And, you know, we do use the higher self to help validate that information. Um, and the best way to get good, even if you don't trust it, is to practice, 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 practice. And, you know, if you're inclined, take one of our courses and pick up some of those additional tools or get the book. The book covers a great deal of that information. There's nothing like a live class, but if you, you don't have time or money, then just get the book. It, it really covers it from soup to nuts as far as what you can ask. Um, in fact, I, my record keepers opened it up to the page that shows the differences between your higher self and your record keepers. Let me see if I can jump into it. Um, the tone of your higher self is more action oriented. The tone of the record keepers is more instructional. You might want to blah, blah, blah. Um, the other thing is once you start working with your higher self and that protocol is also in the app under the wisdom section. Um, once you start working with your higher self, your higher self will start to talk to you ahead of time. You need to stop at the store on your way home or whatever it is. Um, so your higher self can come in unsolicited. But with the record keepers, generally, you need to open that gateway. And the reason for this is because the record keepers, uh, their data set was not initially intended for humanity. And a dispensation was granted for humanity to access the records to assist us in stepping up into our fifth dimensional expression. So it's a little like an open book test. You can open the records on any issue that you are experiencing and get a bigger wisdom that will help you know the next thing to do. Just like if you're taking a chemistry exam, you have the tables that you can use to figure out the answer to the question. Um, and your higher self can be very fast and your record can be keepers can be both fast and slow. They can be very fast that you can hardly scribe it. If you're reading for a client, of course, it's easy because you can just talk it. And compared to in the records, another way that comes through is one word at a time. And if you are thinking to yourself, well, what's the next word? You know, you're not even realizing that you're waiting for the next word. But let's say you get the and and you're just kind of hanging. My advice is put down that very first word because a lot of times they come through one word at a time because what they're about to tell you is such a bombshell that you wouldn't accept it if you heard it as a sentence. You deny it. I made that up. And and so it comes through one word at a time and you're writing it. You get it all done and you read it. You go, oh my gosh. So there's there, this is actually found on page 67 if you have the book, the list of of uh, ways to compare. Now, the benefit of knowing that, knowing these things, is that it gives you the confidence that you don't have otherwise. You know, and our ego wants to do a good job. Our ego wants to be right. And in truth, when you first start out, you might not be. 
you know, when you first start to ride a bike, you might fall off. But it doesn't mean you won't get to, to be a good bike rider. Mm. Yes, I love that. So, and, and we, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, we are your classes, these classes that people can take, are they online, in person? Are they self paced? Uh -huh. They're in Zoom. Occasionally we do them in person. Um, this year we've done one in-person training and then we've done two or more online on like Zoom. Um, so those are very wonderful as a way for people to uh, get skilled. And we have protocols that we require. So you, you get certified after a certain amount of successes and experiences. And then as a certified guide, you can be on our website. And that's very uh, amazing because you'll start to get, you'll get clients from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing. Well, this has just been incredible. Thank you so much for being with us. What events do you have coming up? How can people get your amazing books? You're a prolific writer. So you have a lot of content out there. How can people engage with you? Um, well, I am easily found on Comey as the practical mystic dot Comey, K O M I dot I O. And that's the fastest way to get a bunch of information, especially if you're on your phone. I also have a full on website that has lots and lots of information. And that's the, the practical mystic, uh, excuse me, more, what is it? St. Germain mystery school.com St. Germain mystery school.com. And if you reach out to the info box, that's we have somebody who, um, you know, checks in all the questions and all the requirements. Um, what and was the first one you said? K O R K O M is in Mary and I dot right. I O. Right. So it's practical mystic dot call me. Oh, dot sorry. I, I, I yeah. missed that part. Practical mystic dot me dot I O. Okay. There we go. And um, what happens is uh, that site it's just super easy to use on your phone and it's able, you can share things with people and it has all the links to um, the, some of the products that I recommend. And it also has the links to the, um, the meditation app that I created. Um, and it features some of the interviews that we've done like this one. So it, it just has some really nice shortcuts for you. Um, and of course the books are available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, inner traditions and our website as well. Beautiful. Wonderful. Well, I have loved every second of this. Thank you so much. And I'll mention too, that you're going to be a part of the miracle summit, which is next Thursday, um, November 14th. I couldn't remember what month we were in for a second, November 14th. <laughs> we're going to start at 6 PM Eastern. We will have that replay available for free for um, 12 hours the following day, in case some of you are going to be sleeping during that time. And um, yeah, I can't wait to talk to you there. We're going to be talking about miracles and sharing miracle stories and, um, and then practical tips on how to align with miracles more. So I hope that everybody will join us for that too. So very cool. Yeah. And, and really to find out what's going on, the best thing to do is to go to my events page. Um, we, we always have lots of opportunities like Kara is creating for us and we're happy to support each and every one of you that are present. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. I hope you have an amazing day. Thank you, Maureen. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Bye, everyone. Thank you.